Hey, hey. Ooh, okay. All right, kids, settle down. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming today. I mean, I'll vamp for a few more seconds. Oh, it's almost 8.15. 8.15. Boom. Perfect. Good job, everybody. We made it. <laughs> we made it here so early in the morning. So, like, seriously, give yourself a pat on the back. This is amazing. <laughs> I was telling Jacob, uh, I usually wake up at, like, 10 a.m., so <laughs> this is something different. It's the beauty of freelance life. You decide your own hours. So uh, let's start by just saying a little bit about your tools. Uh, I see a lot of people have things to take notes on and phones out and things like that. That's awesome. I'm going to have some slides that are full of names and things. So I want you to have the ability to take pictures real quick so that you don't forget them. Uh, if you miss anything, then just contact me afterwards. I am so happy to give you any of the slides, any of the things. All right, let's get into it. First thing, let's stretch. <laughs> this is something that so many artists don't do enough of, and especially for the wrists. So um, what I'm going to do is kind of walk you through what I do at least once a day. So I'm really hoping you guys pick up this habit as well. So we're gonna put our arms out in front of us, straight. I'm gonna do it with one hand because I'm poking this thing. All right, so hand out in front of you. You're gonna curl the fingers forward. That's called a monkey paw. And then you're gonna put your wrists down like that and curl your fingers again. And then you're gonna put your palms out. So flip your hands forward. And then you're going to curl your fingers again. And then put your palms in towards you and curl your fingers again. Now, if you do that for about five seconds in each pose, and then do that around like 10 times maybe, only pushing to what you're comfortable with, then your wrists will be well stretched. So you did it, good job. <laughs> now kind of shake it out, loosey goosey, loosey goosey. <laughs> and this is something that will save you in the long run. So just like take care of your body, message number one of every talk I'm gonna ever give, just take care of yourself. You are your best tool. <laughs> so it's super important that you stay aware of your own body. So hi, I'm Anna. <laughs> I am a children's book illustrator and the Myers-Briggs test says I'm an ENFP, which is caring, enthusiastic, and idealistic. I don't know if you know me at all. I, I might have some friends in the crowd. Raise your hand if you're my friend. <laughs> and uh, they know this is very true of me. So I started at the Art Institute of Portland. This is just a little background on myself so you know who the heck is talking. Uh, I started at the Art Institute of Portland, which is now closed, woohoo, but I had fantastic teachers there, got a really great education, and it got me my first job for concept art for video games. So I immediately got into the industry I wanted. It was amazing. But I found that there was a ton of downtime between concept art gigs, you know. The studios don't always have jobs for you. So, during my downtime, I would create personal artwork. Hello. <laughs> uh, and this was from 2017, so you can see in the course of a year, I just kept track of like my favorite piece from each month. And it was, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. <laughs> Sorry, that's pretty loud. So, uh, I created all this personal art, but I didn't really have a drive or a goal for each piece. I was kind of scattered all over the place. Sometimes I'd tell myself, I want to be a video game concept artist, really hardcore, painterly, like make all that juicy concept art. Other times I was like, I like pigs. I'm going to draw them real cute. <laughs> so I didn't have a real goal in mind. Uh, and so I didn't know how to get out of that job into another job until Adobe came into my life. Yay, Adobe. I got the Adobe Creative Residency, which was basically plucking me from obscurity. So I put together a proposal that said, I want to be a children's book illustrator. What? Out of the blue? OK. Uh, yes, I wanted to be a children's book illustrator. I had done research on it and figured that that was my new favorite goal <laughs> in life. Uh, and it absolutely changed my life. If you guys know anything about the creative residency, it is literally like the lottery. Uh, I definitely hit the lottery with these people. I love absolutely every one of them. Uh, you'll see some of them at the conference because there is a creative residency booth. And I have to say that they are the best part of this, like hands down. You'll hear a lot about what the residency offers. It's amazing, but these people are the best part. 
So life changed in many, many ways. <laughs> uh, I got money, opportunities, appreciation. I got to fly everywhere. I got cre <laughs> creative cloud for life, guys. This is insane, I know. But like, that's one of the perks. Literally, we were sitting in our hotel room, all of uh, the residents one night. They had given us this handbook of things about the residency that we didn't know. And Andrea just texted all of us and said, turn to page five. And we're like, why? OK, look at it. it said CC for life. And we were like, that can't be right. Misprint, what? <laughs> so seriously, it just gets better from there. There were so many, so many life-changing things about it that I can't even start on in this talk. So <laughs> uh, we'll move forward. This is the work I started creating during the residency. It was much more driven. I knew what I wanted as a career, and most importantly, I had a mentor who was telling me each step of the way, this will get you to where you want to be. And that is exactly what everybody needs, but not everybody can have a mentor. It takes uh, money, it takes time, it takes talking somebody into teaching you <laughs> how to live your life, basically. So that was one of the things with the residency that completely changed my trajectory going forward. Now my work is very different, as you can see. Uh, and that you know, was part of my huge journey to getting an agent, which is another life-changing factor. Uh, having an agent has been absolutely amazing, but unfortunately I can't talk about a lot of the stuff we've done so far. <laughs> uh, yeah, so if you watch my socials, I am Anna Davis Court everywhere. That's why I married my husband. He has a very rare name. So <laughs> it was just like, I'm the only Anna Davis Court in the world now. So I've got all the Google searches and I will post when anything is published, anything is out. I've worked on a board book, a board game, <laughs> which was out of the blue. I love board games. So that was like, I had to do it. Uh, and I just signed a book deal for a 37 page long book, which usually they're 32. So it's a little odd, <laughs> but I'm super excited for it. So why editing? This is the talk that I wanted to give when I left Max last year. If you don't know, I spoke at Max last year about character design, and I got really positive feedback. That's why they you know, said, hey, come back. Uh, and so I, I heard from most people that they liked practical advice, which can be a rarity here. You know, There are a lot of inspirational talks, but not always a do this, do that kind of talk. So um, I wanted some inspirational stuff too. I wanted to focus on mental well-being and getting in the right headspace. So I've combined those two things. So there's a lot of practical knowledge we're gonna go through and a lot of personal growth inspirational things. So just get ready, mind's blown, it's gonna happen. <laughs> so this work is all about getting you out of ruts finding things that will help you in a time when you cannot go further on a piece and you don't know where to turn. Uh, they're, all gonna, they're going to be like basically checklists of check for these problems in your pieces. And I really want you to take that to heart. Go through your pieces literally and find what you want to change. Some people can look at a blank canvas and just create magic. And it's like, oh, that's amazing. OK, good for you. But I am looking at a blank canvas, and it's the scribbles. <laughs> and Lee, my mentor, actually put it really well in a podcast lately. Uh, he said, these are thinkings, not drawings. So in the days of social media, of course, we want to post everything and say, this is my process. Look how beautiful. But the ugly stuff is where you get to really good work. So I want you guys to remember, you don't always have to post. Uh, and here's an example of exactly what I'm talking about. First of all, I love Harry Potter, so it's going to happen. You're going to see Harry Potter stuff. This is the beginning of a piece that I did that was supposed to be a cover for the Sorcerer's Stone. I started with literally like, what is this? <laughs> like, <laughs> it doesn't look like anything. It's just a bunch of like nonsense. You could see Harry Potter. There are notes I wrote to myself. Uh, here's another page, more nonsense, a little bit of, you know, boxes, kind of, to border things. Uh, you can see the crazy Harry in the middle, like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> And it just gets more refined from there. I took some of those, like, really loose ideas that I look back on them now and I can't see what I drew, but then I got what I was trying to get. So these are, like, getting there, kind of refined, and then this is what I show people. This is, like, oh, it's a sketch, but you can see there's work before that, and those are just a few pages. There's a lot of pages, and I purposefully didn't crop in to show, like, sketch one, sketch two, anything like that. Like, 
real artists, <laughs> not real artists, everybody's a real artist, but if you know like how you start the process, you probably like zoom into the corner of a page or something. Like it's not perfectly laid out grid system. It's just you draw where there's paper or you know digital surface. And then I got onto the value stage and I'm trying to show you like good habits, good habits, go to value and then to color. And this is how the piece turned out with the title on it and everything. Gotta add glow, it's very important for magic glow everything. <laughs> uh, but the, the whole thing about this piece was it was probably one of the hardest that I've done <laughs> in a long time because it took so much ideation. Lee actually told me multiple times when I was making this, like, you're not hitting the right note. You're not, like, this image isn't good enough. I know you can do better. So I had to go backwards many, many times. <laughs> I had to add a little, like, meme in here. <laughs> Everybody get it? Okay, yeah, good, good. good. Okay. <laughs> now, when it comes to your projects, I really want to focus on you guys. Uh, by the way, all of the work in here is mine, not because I am the best at everything, okay? It is because I can't have this stream online with other people's artwork in it. So <laughs> last year I did the character design talk and it was all other people's art and they're like, we can't show that. <laughs> Why not? But uh, so... This is all my stuff. I'm trying to find my best examples to show what I'm talking about, but that's the reason I'm gonna give you guys other artists to reference. Seriously, look them up. They are so good at what they do. Anyways, back to your projects. I really wanna promise that they're gonna be easy, but I can't promise that at all. <laughs> it's just something that you're gonna have to work through. It's, uh, it's better when you struggle, honestly. If you get to a good result, it's worth it and it feels so much better. It's like running and you're like, I did something today, yeah. Even though it sucks. <laughs> but I can promise that we will get to the successful part. If you actually follow the steps, if you don't get lazy at any point in this, you will be successful. You will have a piece of work that you are proud of and it makes the work worth it. Doo -doo -doo. All right, so. I have broken this talk down into two sections, the art and the artist. So the art is what your hand makes. It is basically all of the practical knowledge like I was talking about. It's putting things down on the paper, it's teaching your hand muscle memory, style, technique, things like that. The artist is what happens in your brain while you're doing that. It is what helps you finesse. It's what gives you the reference so that you can put the right things on the paper and decide what you want to include. So let's start with the art. I've broken this down into three sections. Composition, value, and color. Of course, of course, all of this can be expanded on. Each one of these could be their own talk. Um, but we're gonna go through the fundamentals of design because they are so important. If there is an issue with your piece, nine out of 10 times, it's gonna be because of the fundamentals. So I know that people love to do like, oh, that last 10%, adding the little glow or uh, you know, putting fireflies in it or whatever. Like that's the really rewarding, like little cherry on top, it's beautiful. But what is really important is getting all that juice underneath. I need a better analogy, like a food thing, where it's like cherry on top. Okay, the ice cream and the sundae. That's what it is. <laughs> Fundamentals of design. You gotta have different flavors of ice cream, and then all the other stuff is that last 10% that makes it look really good. So this is about the ice cream, not the cherry. <laughs> Disclaimers. These are guidelines, not rules. Rules are you know, meant to be broken or whatever. Guidelines are just like, they're not making any mistakes about what they are. You can break these, there are exceptions, but there's something to acknowledge and then pass by. Uh, these could each be their own talk. Like I said, this is, what is it, 80 minutes or something we get, or 75. Oh my gosh, so there's just like so much that I want to tell you, but I can't say in one talk. Uh, there's a lot of info. You may have heard it before. You're going to be like, uh, duh, especially if you went to design school or art school. It's just going to be like, oh, I know this, but you need to be reminded. Trust me. It's always good to have reminders. So first thing to keep in mind also is storytelling. We're going to think about uh, what is the most important part of making your pieces better, and storytelling is a huge part of that. Now, I used to think that illustrations were background plus character. 
that's it. Now I understand so much more about what it is. It's actually getting your audience to feel about your whatever is going on in this piece. It could be just a background, it could be just a character, but it needs to evoke something and it needs to tell a story. Basically, design is problem solving. And if the problem is reaching your viewers, then story is how you do it. Also, the focal point. <laughs> Again, this is like design school. But the focal point is what all of these tips are gonna be based around, emphasizing the focal point. So just remember that that's like super important. All right, let's get into composition. All right, so here is the reference page of artists. So please take pictures, write them down. Victor Nagai, who I actually met at Icon last year, she's super nice. Uh, Matt Rockefeller and Tadahiro Uesugi. <laughs> I say questioningly, don't wanna butcher names. Uh, but definitely look these up, these artists. They're amazing for, I pick them particularly for composition, but they're amazing at so many things. All right, so we're gonna start with basic rule of thirds. And trust me, it goes from like most basic to hardcore knowledge. So we're gonna get deeper and deeper. So focal point is if you break down, or the rule of thirds is if you break down a piece by the thirds, so you're making a grid on every third line horizontally and vertically, your focal point should line up ideally on one of the intersections of those lines or on one of the lines themselves. That's just a basic thing where it's like, if you want a focal point on your page, this is the place to put it. Also, along the lines of rule of thirds, if you break up a piece in half, it's gonna be a lot more static. It's gonna feel so much less than if you just crop up, have that extra third of space above it. It's like negative space is gold, especially if you're in children's book illustration, that's space for text. <laughs> Woo. All right, so. What can we do about these problems? Well, if you have a focal point that is not on the grid, very clearly fix number one is just move it to the right place. <laughs> now that can be an issue, obviously. Uh, if the uh, focal point is something that's integrated into your piece, it can be an issue, you know, if it's not on its own separate layer. So the other fix you can use is if it's not in the right place, basically like that other piece we saw with the mermaid, crop up and it will show more space and put that focal point in the right space. Remember that your, the edges of your canvas are liquid. They can go anywhere. So if, especially when like those rough sketches of Harry Potter, if you're trying to put together a composition, don't put a box around it immediately. Just draw the insides and let it decide its own edges. All right, so we've gone over rule of thirds. That was super easy, super fast. Everybody good? We all feeling good? Okay, excellent, good thumbs up. <laughs> all right, next is going to be focal pointing, number two of composition. This is basically using the elements of your piece to guide the viewers with shape and line to your focal point. So it's even in a very complicated piece, it can be a, a background thing that really emphasizes what you're trying to emphasize, <laughs> is pointing people without being overly obvious about it. Even in this piece, like you can see, it's super busy. It's got a lot of leaves going on. The viewer might not even know it when they are pointed to this place. But I put the thought in and tried to like get that motion in there. Uh, another name for this would be rhythm in a piece. Uh, but this is, you know, my talk, so I get to decide what it's called. And I thought focal pointing was kind of funny. All right, so some common problems I see. Pointing right off the page, it can just lead the eye right off. So when somebody sees your piece, they're not looking at it, they're looking at what your piece is looking at, sliding right off. Uh, this is also a big exception for this is in children's books. If you've ever heard the term page turn, this is how you get a page turn, because they're like, what's next, you know? But uh, as a, a basic guideline, don't point off the edge of the page. Lack of payoff. Uh, your focal point can be missing. I actually see this a lot, it's kind of surprising, but uh, having things point to a place that has no payoff is like punishing your viewer for looking at it. <laughs> They're like, but where, where the thing? So I want you guys to always remember to look at your pieces and ask yourself, where's the focal point? And like, do you have one? That's real important to have. 
uh, directing away from the focal point. So this is just counter to our purpose. We want people to look right to a certain spot. Why would you guide them away? So the fixes that we have, oh, come on. Oh, there we go, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so the fixes that we have are very intuitive as well. Reinforce pointing to the focal point, break those lines. If you have something that's guiding away from the view or the focal point, then have something break those lines and go back to it. Add space in front of the, the character and have counter flow worked into your piece. Even if it's not the most predominant rhythm of the piece, even just having a little bit of like grass pointing to the focal point, it can make a huge difference. Add a clear focal point. That's easy. <laughs> just add that payoff. Woo. All right, next we have tangents. It is very simple. Uh, Tangents are the worst. <laughs> have you ever seen a piece where you're like, this would be amazing if they just didn't have that tangent, dang it. Tangents are when two objects meet unintentionally and cause a tension to be added to the piece and guide the viewer's eye to it. So I made this piece, <laughs> this piece, it's beautiful by the way. I know you love my drawings on this. Uh, it is, all these shared points are in red and I, <laughs> I'm always sad when there is a piece like this because I'm like, it's so easy to fix, especially if you use individual layers. Uh, this is a piece that I painted over to give it more tangents. Can you see any of them? Point out any tangents on the right? If you don't see them, you're a monster. <laughs> How dare. I've outlined them to show it more easily. The one that bugs me the most is the swordfish meeting the shadow edge. For some reason, that just irks me so badly. Um, luckily, I was painting to make it more obvious, and this wasn't my original piece. <laughs> Thank goodness. Uh, but yeah, they usually are very easy to fix. Fix number one, add space. Ta-da! Wow, magic. I'm so glad you came here. That's my max talk. <laughs> fix number two, overlap them. Yay! So literally, the hardest part of this is not the fix. It's seeing the problem. It's training your eyes to find those issues and tackle them. So it's not gonna take a lot of time, especially if you use separate layers to just overlap or add space, but remember to check your piece before posting it and ask yourself, are there any tangents? Now let's get into value. This one's much harder than composition. <laughs> and remember, there's so much more to composition. I am not saying that it's like easy at all, but I would highly recommend taking a class on it if you can. Value though is, Whew, it's a beast. It's probably my biggest weakness, I think. I'm gonna show you a piece later that is another Harry Potter thing. <laughs> By the way, these are the references, please take pictures. Um, but I'm gonna show you a piece later that I legitimately was like, I can't make this better, how do I fix it? And it was literally the simplest answers. Ugh, but we'll get into that later. Oh, did everybody get this? Yeah, yeah, you good? Okay, cool. Uh, J.C. Lyon Decker, Nicholas Delort, who actually is an artist uh, who's at the same agency that I am. So my goal is obviously to meet everybody who's at the agency, including Pascal Campion, who's doing a talk. Whoop, whoop. Uh, John Classen and Edward Gorey. Classic, classic. <laughs> John Classen is a children's book illustrator as well. A lot of children's book illustrators. Sorry, guys. That's my reference. The pool. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. Value keys. These are the breakup of uh, the range from black and white. Basically, like you have full range, black and white. This breaks it down into three different keys. So there's high key, mid key, and low key. If you've never heard this, you probably know them by a different term. I know them by value key. And each key has its own personality and can be used to different effect. These are some examples of high key, mid key, and low key in my work. Uh, it was actually kind of hard to find them. <laughs> I feel like almost everybody finds a key that's comfortable to them and they just stick to it. Of course, you can dip into different values to create points of contrast, but we'll also get that into that later. All right. Now, I'm going to dip into contrast immediately, actually, because uh, they go hand in hand, keys and contrast. So if keys are the three different ranges broken down, contrast is any range. So it goes from black to white, that's the highest contrast you can have. If it goes between grays, it's the low contrast. 
I'm sure you guys know what contrast is. I'm just clarifying. <laughs> All right, so let's add keys and contrast together. So we've got a high key. So you can see the circle in the middle is the key. And then it's a low contrast because it's a very similar value to it. Next, we've got mid contrast, high key. And then high contrast, high key. Do you guys follow that? Where it's like dark against light, that's the most contrast you can have. It gets less contrasty to the left, more contrasty to the right, but it's all remaining high key because the majority of the piece is light colors. Colors, <laughs> values. <laughs> all right, next we go to mid key, and you can see exactly the same thing, low contrast, mid contrast, and high contrast. And then low key, we've got mostly dark colors here, but it goes from low contrast, mid contrast, to high contrast. Now, why do I mention this? It's not just to give you uh, an idea of like, these are things, be aware. Uh, these have meaning behind them. These are connotations with each one of these. If you go with high contrast, but a low key, you're gonna get some like strong pop of mood. It feels energetic. It's very high contrast, so you're always gonna have that feeling of like, whoa, what am I looking at? It's kind of attacking you. Uh, in the upper corner, we've got the high key, low contrast, and that feels very light and ethereal. Uh, of course, mid, mid is gonna be safe and calming. It's super safe. It feels like, okay, nothing's offending me, but it's not super ethereal and light either. And then of course, low, low contrast, or low key, low contrast is a dark kind of gloomy. It gives you a feeling of uh, mysterious possibly. And all of these things can be used to just amp up your piece. If you think of this before you start even working, like what mood do I want this piece to have? Especially if it's say like dark, mysterious, boom, you've got a key all ready for you and you just like cut out so much of the work and it's gonna be so much more effective. So this is an example piece of mine. Again, it's an outlier with its value key. Uh, I would say, what do you guys think? What is this key and contrast? Like out of the grid that we showed before, which one would you pick for this? I'd say that it would be high key, mid contrast. So we've got high key, overall light, mid contrast. It goes to a, a, a mid dark gray. I mean, it's not like the darkest gray, of course. <laughs> We're gonna get into how dark is that gray? 50 shades of gray with Anna Davis court. <laughs> <laughs> But as you can see, the lightest and the darkest points of this piece are concentrated around the focal point. It is so important to have an idea of where your contrast lies. So contrast, say Mike Mignola does, does the uh, Hellboy comics, super black, super white, like very graphic. That's a perfect example of the exception to this, but I want you guys to just acknowledge what do you want your work to look like? Do you want it to have that graphic quality? That's a pow right in the face? Or do you want it to have a, a certain depth to the grayscale? Because trust me, if you color something that has weak value, it's not going to look as good. Like, as good. It's not going to look good. Sorry. But value is more important to, than color to me. <laughs> Here's my embarrassing piece. <laughs> so this is uh, Hedwig, obviously, you know, bringing a letter home. And I couldn't figure out what the heck was going wrong with this piece. And I was getting frustrated because uh, Lee was expecting it soon. You know, we had deadlines in the residency. And uh, my husband is actually an artist as well. And I asked for his help and Lee's help. Luckily, I have just so many assets. <laughs> but they brought out the dreaded red line and were like, okay, let's, uh, like, this is a really obvious problem. Uh, the stars are too bright and the houses and the owl are the same value. Like, what is the point of this piece? Where are you trying to guide people's eye? And I'm like, obviously the letter, look at it, it's white. Uh, but those stars are just as white. So it wasn't reading. Uh, the houses were getting muddled with the owl. So with a fix, we've got darker houses. We've got a slightly lighter owl, but the lightest of the light against the darkest of the dark is the letter against the sky. And obviously there are other driving forces to the focal point like flow and uh, level of detail. But the most important thing that you see when looking at this from afar is the value contrast right at that face. And then Lee had this moment of brilliance as well 
light up that window on the house, and that's a secondary read. It's like you look at the letter first, and then you see, huh, what's that one window doing? It's Harry waiting up for his letter. How cool is that? I'm just like, Phew. I don't know, the little you know, things, it's just so fun. What we do is really fun, sorry. <laughs> I get excited sometimes. All right, so when it comes to fixing these issues, obviously we all love uh, Mama Adobe. I think of her as a mom, maybe you think Papa. But <laughs> using Photoshop, you can use the tools of levels or curves, I prefer levels personally, to push them too far. Uh, I want you to go further than you think you should and pull it back. Uh, go too light, go too dark, figure out that middle point. That's at least my favorite fix, is just to figure out how to balance it. Fix number two is to make a rough map of your major values and stick to it. That's the important part, is you don't just make this map and then forget it exists. Like actually keep it on your canvas to remind you, this is what I'm going for, this is what I'm trying to achieve with my final look. So easiest way, just create three or four layers of, uh, in Photoshop and then lock the pixels and you can dump whatever values in there really quickly. Just keep you know, multiplying the layers and then you can have multiple different moods that you're trying to get across shown very easily next to each other. Pick your favorite, use it. Fix number three, and this is kind of an assignment I want you guys to take home, is to test your pieces. I want you to look at what you've created recently or far back, whatever you wanna look at, and just see if the highest point of contrast is where you want it. Is it at the focal point? I wanna see, and post it to social media. I'd love to see if you actually find something where it's like, I did it, yeah, I'd be a proud mama. <laughs> All right, third section of value. Guys, we're motoring through, good job. Woo. All right, local values. This one, of, of course, they get a little more complicated as we go on. So local values are values that are assigned to objects in your piece. So say uh, skin tone of a person or hair color of a person, not color, but value. Uh, this is with light and dark applied to it, light and shadow, I should say. Uh, and these are the good examples. So you can imagine on the left that there is a white ball. On the right, you can imagine maybe that's like a red ball. You guys know like red in black and white is super dark. It's way darker than you expect. <laughs> uh, and you can see in this more complex piece how it kind of holds up. We've got the lightest, the darkest, and the local. These, I, I wanna show you the next slide honestly to describe it because uh, the most important part of this is not to go too dark. So this is a good example of mid-key, not breaking the locals. This is breaking the locals. It's going full white and full black. It disregards whatever value the object itself is and just goes for dark light. This is way too common, honestly. Like, I want more people to talk about this. Spread the good news <laughs> to your friends and family that you know what local values are and can stick to it because it happens too often. And honestly, this along with another issue that I'll get to in color are the reason that a lot of people weren't hired at the studios I've worked at. So this is an example of what that piece would look like if we just ignored local values. The, like, squint your eyes. Where is your eye going first? Maybe it's still the face, but honestly, the dress is calling out to me the most, where it's that light and the dark. It's too much. Everything is overemphasized. There is no soft too hard. There's no rough to refine. It is just all kapow. So we're going to go back to that other one. Oh, doesn't that feel better? <sighs> <laughs> uh, but I also want to draw your attention to her back for a second. You see how dark the dress is and how light that light is on her back. She's still got the dress there, but I chose to really push that light. And that, that was to get the effect of blown out light to make it feel like, whoa, it is super bright out there, the sun. So that was a choice to break the rule or guideline, whatever. It is totally within your power to do that, but I want you to just acknowledge the rule before breaking it. But back? Sorry. <laughs> I'll take requests. Absolutely. These two? You like that? Woo. <laughs> and then side by side, you can see them. <laughs> this is my mom and her dog, Rudy, by the way. 
they're real cute together. She spends 90% of her garden, or her time in her garden. So uh, I made this for her birthday, just to remember what it looks like right now, because it's always changing. All right. Oh, sorry. This one has a fix that I hope is really intuitive to you guys, as it is to me. Um, if you are planning out a piece, like making those value breakdowns, like we said before, you'll have each of the major elements on their own layer. If you assign the color to each of those, or the value to each of those, like say you have a forest and one of the layers is trees, you want them all to be a similar value because they're all the same kind, then it's pretty easy to just add the darkest darks that that value allows and the lightest light that, that value allows without breaking it and stick to that. Like, if you just put it in really roughly, you can add all the details you want and not break your local values. So giving yourself that little cheat sheet of just like, oh, there's a fox, I want it to be this value. Oh, I'm gonna add the light and the dark and see, you know, just basically how dark and how light I want it to be at the most extreme level. And then you have all of that grayscale in between to play with. Okay, well, before we get into color, like let's just like shake it out a little bit, like stretch, move around. <laughs> We've been going through a lot, so I feel like whew, we should breathe. Oh, I should drink water, that's a good idea. I keep having like throat lozenges and stuff because I'm talking way too much at max. Hmm. Okay, <clears throat> whew, color. This is the biggest one where I have to say you could get so much deeper into color. Color is endless, it is so subjective, uh, but these are the things that I've found are really important to me as an artist. These have literally changed my career in the last year, just understanding these basic rules. But I could get into you know, warm light versus cool light, illustrative versus realistic color, all of that stuff. Um, might teach an online class on it someday because I really feel strongly about it. <laughs> I wanna talk to, talk to everybody about it. These are some color references. Phone's out. <laughs> Good job, you guys. James Gurney is a legend in concept art like industry. He's amazing. Ty Carter was also a mentor of mine for a time. He was an artist at Blue Sky Studios and is such an expert at color. He described things in the clearest way I've ever heard them described. I will not do as good of a job, sorry. <laughs> Zoe Persico and Nicholas Cole are both artists that I know, and they are just amazing. Uh, like, Zoe has children's book style for sure, very illustrative, throws color everywhere. Nicholas Cole has some of the most beautiful gradients from one color to another. Oh my gosh, so gorgeous. He uh, worked on Spyro Reignited, if you guys have seen that. So good. Anyways, let's start. Uh, on my first section, I have chosen palettes, but before we get to really like into palettes, we need to know the color wheel. <laughs> Basic design school stuff again, yay. All right, so the color wheel is gorgeous, rainbows, amazing. Uh, but we've got the primary colors, blue, yellow, red, secondary, orange, green, purple, tertiary, everything in between. I will not say them all in the row because my mouth doesn't do that well. <laughs> so these are all the colors that we have at our discretion. But within those, we have some palette options. These are just a few of my favorite. On the left, we've got monochromatic. That means one color with its tints and shades. Complementary, we've got opposite colors on the color wheel with their tints and shades. And then analogous are all buddies that just hang out together and they're wonderful. Analogous is one of my personal favorites. Oh, sorry. Um, other than that, I also love split complementary, but I wanted to put three on here, so. <laughs> Split complementary is a good one, look it up. <laughs> uh, but what we can find with these ones is they all have connotations kind of with them as well. Uh, monochromatic creates a very strong mood. If you have only one color in a piece, people know what you're going for based on that one color. If it's blue, it's calm, if it's red, it's crazy, you know, just stuff like that. You feel it before you acknowledge it in your brain. Complementary, of course, is just like value contrast. These colors are the furthest apart from each other, so you're gonna have a lot of pop to it. It's gonna be energetic. They choose a lot of uh, complementary colors for movie posters and things like that. If you look at them, oh my gosh, so much blue and orange. <laughs> and it's because they want people to look at it from like 10 miles away and be drawn in. Analogous, harmonious. They are just so cool and chill together. I love analogous. And especially if you use analogous with like a little pop of a different color, 
emphasis, boom, happens. Of course, we have warm and cool. Uh, warm and cool are obvious like difference between them, but I also, I'm going to get into very briefly a dangerous topic that my husband told me not to include, <laughs> and that's color relationships. It's a complex topic. It's how colors read against each other, and warm and cool are essential to that. We'll get into it later. I'm going to say stuff, regardless of what he thinks. <laughs> All right, so one problem that we find very often in people who have not studied color enough, I'd say, I don't know. I hate to say stuff like that because I honestly am a big proponent of thinking everybody's art at everybody's level has a place. Like, no matter where you're at, you make somebody happy with what you make. And if nothing else, it should be you that you make happy. So I don't want to say like, oh, they're not there or whatever, but this is just an issue with color that I've seen a lot, uh, is ununified color. Uh, to unify color, really easy. You make it tend toward warm or cool. That's one easy fix. There are other fixes that are a lot more complex. Again, this could be its own talk. Uh, but this kind of example, you can see so much, like feel how much better the one on the right is to your eyes. That's the visceral reaction color can have. Next, fix number two, create a color map, just like value maps, basically. Use those same layers, honestly, just like from your value map, you can make a color map so easily. And have those, oh yeah, you can use outside reference. I was gonna tell you about the upper right piece. That is not a color palette I would come to normally. It is usually, like, I, I love analogous, I love harmonious things, but that one, I saw a piece on Pinterest and I was like, Nobody owns the copyright to colors. <laughs> I could use those. And they're like, gorgeous, especially in that piece. I ended up picking the uh, central top one, but uh, it's such an easy thing that not a lot of people do, where you can have those pixel locked layers, dump any color in, and figure out from there where, like, what mood you want, what, which one calls to you the most. Next, we've got connotations, which goes hand in hand with value once again. These colors have some connotations to them. What do you think they are? Like, shout out whatever you feel when you look at the left or the right. Anything? Anything? <laughs> well, on the left, I see a lot of green. So I'm thinking foresty. I'm thinking like lush. I'm seeing forest and undergrowth. On the right, there's a lot of warm colors thinking like maybe sunset, maybe fire, possibly. Maybe I'm, you know, biased because I know what these pieces are. <laughs> uh, these are sisters in my mind. So they relate to each other. Uh, they have a harmonious palette all together, but they are obviously different from each other. I actually painted uh, the right one at Max last year as a demo. And uh, in fresco, Adobe fresco, available today. Uh, <laughs> But the feeling of having two color palettes that unite and yet are distinctly different, the way I tackled that is basically what I told you before the fix was. Warm palette. That's as simple as I can put it without getting too muddled in the details, is just a warm palette can unify everything. I, of course, love warm, but you can love cool. It's fine. <laughs> uh, this one, <laughs> don't you love my drawings? Um, this one, I wanted to show you connotation with color in the most basic way I could possibly think of it. This guy's angry. He's just like, rah, raging out. I imagine metal music happening. Uh, and yet this blue is doing something. It's like taken away. Don't you feel like this? It's like blue-ish. Change it to red and suddenly the rage is on, you know? He's just, oh, I'm so angry. Uh, so <laughs> hopefully that gets across to you in the most basic way what color can do. All right, so uh, we've got some issues with, let's see, just our color in general. It's not doing what we want it to do. Uh, my favorite tools to deal with this are hue saturation, color balance, and selective color. Those things all do very individual things. If you have never used them before, I highly recommend looking up tutorials or going to the forums and just figuring out exactly how you can use them, especially if you want to make your color better. Because understanding those tools, even in just like the like four minute tutorial you can find, will change how you are capable of adjusting your color. 
Uh, and save out multiple options. So if you go too far to one side and put it next to the other, like a lot of times say, I use color balance and I love going up on magenta and just being like, yeah, get it red, get it red. And then I put it next to the original or turn it on and off or whatever. And only next to each other can you see how red you've gone. Where it's just like your eyes adjust almost instantly. And so you need that balance to figure out how far is too far. And fix number two is to back up and create color maps. I'm always going to be a proponent of doing more work earlier so that your piece turns out better later. Uh, these are for a book cover I was going to do. I really need to finish it. <laughs> this is the last assignment I had as the creative resident, and I didn't finish it. I feel horrible about it. So uh, these, I think, though, are probably some of my more successful studies, uh, getting different moods across with different colors. Uh, if you know anything about this story, a lot of the mood is conveyed in the imagery and the value here. So the color is like the cherry. It's like that last bit to really slam home what I was trying to do with this. So I wanted to just show these two in particular next to each other. And like you can even block them out with your hand one at, the, at a time and just see how dang different those feel just in emotion. I mean, right is obviously Slytherin, but you know. <laughs> So all of these things combined, right now we are looking at imagery, value, and color, which all contribute to the mood, which makes the story come across. This is why it gets more complex. You know, like we started with like tangents, <laughs> now we're here. There's a lot layered in every image and you have to think about each piece individually and give it its own time. Now our last section of color, guys, oh, we're so close. We're gonna get to artists soon and I'm so excited, okay. So now we are into saturation. Uh, this is, uh, certain parts I'm like, okay, it's not as important. And some parts I'm like, this is critical to your career. So saturation on the color grid or scale, whatever this is called, um, obviously it goes to gr from gray to the highest pigment you could possibly get. And I have some examples here of a little bit of work. This piece I forgot I had made, and I was like, I have no pastel pieces. I have no example of this. Should I quick make one? I was like, oh yeah, I did that bunny thing. So uh, this was also done in Adobe Fresco. Uh, and this is a pastel color palette. So very low saturation, but still has a lot of like punch to it. It's against white, so that makes sense. And this is about as saturated as I go on the left with Dobby. He is a pretty dang saturated boy. Like, <laughs> he's got a lot of colors going on, and this is very, like, especially in children's illustration, saturation is everything. As in, they want you to go more saturated nine out of 10 times. They're just like, pump it, kids like it. <laughs> I'm like, but the art. Uh, so this is what I would call the gray zone, the safe zone, and the danger zone. Gray zone, you Got to use it intentionally. Say you're doing something realistic, you might live here. You know, realistic colors don't always go super big on color or pigment. Uh, but I like the safe zone, personally. That's the biggest area to play around. Uh, and then the danger zone is if you get too saturated, if it's just harsh on the eyes. And I'll show you an example of that. So Dobby, he's grayed out on the left. Poor guy. He looks like he's in a vintage like newspaper or something. Uh, he's fading away quick. And then we have the middle, which I think personally is a good level of saturation. Of course, it's all up to your palette. And then there's way oversaturated Dobby. Like he got dipped in acid. What's going on? <laughs> and it just hurts the eyes to look at something like that. I really hope it reads on the monitor like I feel like it does to me. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a lot. Now this is the biggest point. Saturation of shadows. This is what people wouldn't get hired at studios that I worked at for. So a lot of people think shadow is just take a color and make it darker, right? Just go straight down on that color picker. That's not what I've found. You can make shadows more saturated, like way more saturated. And it gives the, the piece so much more life and pop. Like, let's just look at that again. Like blur your eyes so that it doesn't look all liney. And then, Oh, come on, the boop. <laughs> it just adds so much more color to the piece. It adds so much more personality. Uh, and this, especially if you're studying life, you'll see everywhere. If you've seen rocks at the beach, 
there is no black shadow on a rock at the beach. Like there's so much color. I had an oil painting uh, professor. She also worked at Disney. She's done a lot of stuff. Anyways, um, she was painting rocks at the beach and put pure magenta in the shadow. And I was like, where, where is that? And she put it there and it was just like, that is where it belongs. Magic, it's real. Where's my wand? All right, so here's a piece with full saturation. The fix to this, uh, I, I find the problem of it is that it's not really emphasizing any point. If we concentrate saturation once again around the focal point, our most important point, uh, then we can create a lot more depth with our piece and have the eye rest in certain areas and be drawn towards the focal point, as always. Uh, this is easiest, um, if the easiest way to implement this is if you have separate layers, of course, you could just have the moon and stars on one layer, make the moon more saturated and like radially go out. Or you can use layer masks, easily pop on a hue saturation layer, pump it up to 10, and then uh, have the gradient in the mask to just make it fall away at other parts. I hope you guys like know what I'm talking about. Photoshop, yay. <laughs> All right, so this is a quick warning before I get to the, uh, the stuff James doesn't want me to talk about. So uh, quick warning is that adjustments may cause unintentional saturation increases. This, this is a constant. So once you learn, especially color balance, learn to put a hue saturation layer over that and just like beep it down a little bit because you need it. It is so easy to go over saturation when you're just finagling with colors willy nilly. So now let's get into the, uh, the stuff we shouldn't talk about. What color do you guys think this is? Shout it out. Green, good job. I mean, wait, no, it's a trap. <laughs> All right, so in this piece, can you find that green? Hint, it's not in the leaves. It's the fish, good job, you guys, you got eyes, woo. So this fish, it looks yellow when you first see the piece, but in actuality, it is green. Uh, and this is the point of what I wanted to really briefly touch on because I'm already behind time. Uh, I want to tell you about color relationships. Everything is relative, every single thing. So if something looks less saturated, uh, put it next to an even more less saturated color, suddenly it looks more saturated. If you want it to look warmer, but you can't possibly physically get it any warmer, put a cool color next to it. It will make it sing. So I just wanted to like really quickly tell you guys that everything is relative. This is something you will learn more and more as you get into color knowledge and theory, um, but it is, something that's just completely changed my work is knowing exactly how to put things next to each other and have them sing because they're together. It's harmony. So this one I definitely want you guys to take a picture of. This is everything that we've learned today. Uh, we've got the rule of thirds, focal pointing, tangents. We've got value keys, contrast, local values, and we've got palettes, connotations, and saturation. Uh, this is what I want you guys to go home and do a checklist of. I want you to like actually go through and check your next piece to see that you've got all these things down. Hopefully I've described them in a way that you can remember exactly what I was talking about. Uh, but it's super important to just have something literally at your desk to remind you to go through these motions. Now, oh, whew, okay, stretch again. Woo, 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 we're almost there. All right. So this is the section about you guys, your brains, and how to make them grow. <laughs> so I've broken it down into three sections once again, because rule threes. Uh, we've got the visual library, tips and headspace, and then of course I'm sending you home with assignments, I have to. So, if you can't tell this drawing is a library within your brain. Uh, <laughs> it's called a visual library. This is a term that was coined by Feng Zhu of FZD School on YouTube. For some reason it won't go. Um, Feng Zhu is an amazing concept artist, such a different style than mine, so like definitely look him up. He's worked on every production. Um, and he is an amazing teacher. So many of his classes are online for free, and there's like an hour and a half class on visual library alone. So if you are curious about any of the stuff I'm about to talk about, see all of the in-depth stuff that he think, or, you know, discusses. So a visual library is basically what happens when you look at something in the world and dissect it. 
you analyze it. What the heck is it made of? Uh, what is interesting to you about it? And how you can log that away as reference that you keep. This is something that nobody can take away from you. You keep it in your brain. You are basically an amalgamation of your experiences. So this is something that makes every artist unique. What you gather from the world is different from anybody else. When you see uh, a scene, a basketball game, say, then you take something different away from it than other people do. Uh, if you are a curious artist, as I'm sure most of us are, then you will get reference like nobody's business. It doesn't take something interesting. It takes being alive. <laughs> you just look at stuff, you see it, and you acknowledge that it's amazing. You look at the clouds constantly because they're amazing. I uh, got in trouble so many times as a kid, like telling my mom to look at clouds when she was driving. She's like, but you gotta look, it's so pretty. Uh, all right, so here's a little test of your visual library. Draw a horse real quick. Like you can mentally draw it, it's fine, but I just want you to think of like the parts. What does a horse look like? We're gonna do a profile of it, because clearly, I mean, if you did a front-on view of a horse, you'd be insane. I'm sorry. <laughs> and there are some people who literally study drawing horses exclusively, and they're amazing at it. Uh, but it is one of the notoriously hardest things to draw. So we've got like a, a body and some legs and a head and a neck and it's weird and it's wonky. Pointy little ears, I remembered that. Uh, but I want to also show you uh, what it looks like in reality. If it'll switch, come on. There we go. Thanks to Adobe Stock, yay. <laughs> we've got a real horse here. Look at the pointy ears are real. Uh, but just like study this for a second. Think about all of the flow we're seeing here, like how the neck tapers, what the heck that muzzle does. It's like it curves down and then juts back up. And then we've got like a teardrop shape for the shoulder. We've got angles that kind of match each other on how the leg meets the shoulder and how the hoof goes upward as well. So any kind of patterns that you can see in something that also helps for you to remember it. Uh, how the butt slopes down, what weird shape the legs make, all that kind of stuff is now in your brain. You're welcome. You know how to draw a horse perfectly now. <laughs> so let's just try that again real quick. Like draw a horse after seeing that. Obviously like proportions are off, things are wonky, but that's a lot better. <laughs> it definitely makes a difference to see the thing. And again, like Feng Zhu goes so much further into this and how it can change your career to have a background with more experiences like this. So what do we do to become the best, like have the best visual library? Have like the Beauty and the Beast library, but in our heads, you know? Like, whoa, so many books. Well, live a full life. Like literally the best news you could hear today. Just like excuse to do anything. Just like go watch movies, read books, listen to music, go to museums and zoos and like, Travel, experience life, go find things to be excited about. That is the best way that you're gonna become a full visual librarian and always know how to pull from something. I mean, Vza, who is the oil painter slash Disney animator, she said that animators in particular are basically like novices at everything. They've just done research a little bit into everything because they have to know so much. Like you're animating somebody who's a ballet dancer, go learn about ballet real quick, okay. So uh, the other thing that I wanted to say about the visual library is have a goal. What do you wanna improve about your piece this time? When you come back to getting to work, the next time you're at a canvas, I want you to think, am I improving my composition, my value, my color, my proportions, storytelling? Like what do you want to improve about this one piece? That was something that I used to really great effect when I was working at that video game company. I would just paint pretty girls because like it's the easiest thing. <laughs> and I absolutely adored Lowish. So I was just like, oh my gosh, I want to paint pretty girls. But every single time I would paint a pretty girl, I would have something else in mind where I was like, okay, today I'm going to study value. I'm going to make my colors better. I'm going to try the ambiguity of foliage. I want to stylize it in some way. So having a, a goal for each single piece does two things. It gives you obviously a heading, but also it takes away some of the pressure, hopefully. 
it takes away the feeling that you have to do everything in the next piece because that's just not sustainable. You have to think, this is my one goal, and if I hit that, sweet. If I don't hit it, next time. Next is just embrace reference. Pinterest is your friend. Uh, reference is the absolute best. And I have to say that the one thing that if I have a weak piece and proves it, no, like no exception, it's always gotten better, it's reference. Of course, the, the horse showed you that clearly. <laughs> All right, so assignment-wise, I want you to draw from reference and imagination equally, if you can. Everybody has to balance things out sometimes and figure out what they want to say. But uh, the, the drawing from reference can be great, but drawing from only reference dries you out real quick. Drawing from your imagination is great, but you're going to run out of information at some point, so just balance those two out. And remember that it's a marathon, not a sprint. Give yourself space. <laughs> I can talk. Give yourself time and space to grow because these things don't happen overnight. Again, you are your best tool. Wah! Just like the stretching, you know, you got to take care of the brain. All right, so real quick tips. This is also supposed to be a joke, but James didn't get it. So do you guys get it? It's like techniques for improving faster. Okay, anyways. Uh, so... This, is, uh, this section is basically when you don't know how to get out of a rut, these are tips for you to get out of that rut. Uh, and it starts with the most obvious and also the most important, take a break. Anytime that you step away from your work, you will come back way better. You will see fresh things. You will see what was wrong with it and why uh, you were having such a uh, hard time. Taking a break is always like, it's my weakness in a lot of ways, because of course you don't want to take a break when you're like, it's due, but it is so important to step away. Like, if you grind through 16 hours and don't ever take a break, you're coming out with worse work than if you had done an eight-hour break and then spent another four hours on it. Trust me. Oh yeah, a little cat. <laughs> Get away from work. Go to life. Yay. All right, and next is... Flip the canvas. Once again, it's pretty obvious, but <laughs> if you've never used this trick, you will be astounded by how horrible it looks, <laughs> especially when its face is like, for some reason, the eyes are always off. It just happens. Uh, but flipping the canvas can help in so many ways, especially like balance of a piece. Say you're doing like a long landscape or something. If you flip it and the balance just feels like, okay, everything's on that side. Uh, it, it just shows you a freshness, kind of like taking a break, but instantly. All right, and zoom out. This, I can't tell you how many people I've like, said this to. Zooming out, if your piece reads at a stamp size, it will read at mural size. If it is solid when it's small, all that you're getting when it gets bigger is details. And details don't make art. Like, they can be a wonderful part of it, but it's so important to have, just like we said, the foundations there first. So zooming out will provide that. So silly. All right, I just love my drawings for this, sorry. Uh, give and receive constructive criticism. Uh, I, I first put receive constructive criticism in here, but I've learned, especially through teaching, giving criticism, constructive criticism, is so integral to the artist experience and it teaches you way more, honestly. If you can spot problems in other people's pieces, you'll spot them in yours way easier. Uh, and this also bu builds community. It gives you uh, a person that you trust. I think it was Nicholas Cole gave a talk at Lightbox, and he had a quote up that I'm going to butcher. Uh, he said it said that like don't accept advice from people that you wouldn't uh, like trust or something like that. Gosh, I should I should have written this down. But it was a great quote, basically on curating who you take advice from. If somebody's, oh, that was it. Okay, don't take criticism from people you wouldn't ask for advice. Boom, nailed it, yeah. That was off the top of my head, guys. You don't know how rarely that happens. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I think that that is a wonderful point. Obviously, there are exceptions, but I do want you to curate who you let into your life and who you trust with your work. Um, not like they're going to steal it, but I want you to feel like you're getting criticism that you want because anybody could say your work is bad. That's easy. But like telling you why and wanting it to get better, that's a rarity. And it'll build bridges between you and other artists. 
Next is work in a different medium. This one has really helped me out lately. I did Inktober and it was the most therapeutic thing I've ever done for myself. I also make sculptures and that is to get something tactile. It changes like literally your brain neurons connections when you do something different with your hands. You're still creating. It still feels like art and you get that sweet, sweet payoff of like endorphins that are like, oh my gosh, I just made something and I like it. Uh, but it's completely different for your hands and your muscle memory. And I highly recommend picking up some Sculpey and just playing with it. It takes 15 minutes to bake and you can paint them and it's fun. Uh, number eight is to, <laughs> this is the best piece of advice I took away from a children's book conference lately. Stop working when you know what you're going to do next. So step away from your computer or whatever when you know that you want to change that shirt to red. And then when you come back, you just change the shirt to red and you're in your work. You're like starting a flow from a ramp. It's awesome. And this has literally changed everything about my workflow. I now write down like what I'm gonna do next so that when I come to my computer, it's almost like I'm talking to myself. I'm like, hey Anna, you're doing so well today. Okay, now start with this. And it's like, oh my gosh, thank you Anna. Oh my gosh, <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, so I would highly recommend just trying it out. Of course, not everything works for everyone, but I hope it works for you. Number nine is find ways to stay excited. This is a secret of so many industries that people get bored all the time. So, <laughs> the carrot on a stick. Uh, I want you to start as soon as possible training yourself to stay excited. Hopefully some of you are doing that already. Uh, if you're working in an industry, I'm sure you are. Uh, if you ever think, I don't like what I'm doing right now, I don't enjoy it, it's your job to make it enjoyable. I mean, I'm sorry to say that. Like, I, I wish that all clients were like dream clients, but it's just not going to work out that way. And to get a paycheck, you have to make the work. So Instead of saying, like, just do what you want, dreams come true, all that stuff, you have to work to make the mindset that will get you through the hard parts. I'm, I'm a children's book illustrator, okay? It's going to be, like, some books are really long, okay? <laughs> You're drawing the same characters for months, doing, like, slightly different things sometimes. Uh, so it can get boring, and it's something that every artist has to deal with in their own way, in their own industry, but it is super important to just trick yourself. So say I'm in month six of drawing the same character. I have to think something like the previous slide, what do I want to improve this time? Or what do I think is like the coolest part of this? I'm going to wait to paint it last so that I have like that, you know, little incentive at the end. Uh, things like that are very individual, what motivates you, but I want you to think about that and figure out what for you will make these things bearable instead of just thinking, this sucks, because that gets you nowhere. So these are the tips all together. Feel free to take pictures again. Uh, all of them are highly individual, but they are the best things that I can put together for you guys. Like, I really thought about this talk. I hope you get something from it because like, this is probably my favorite compilation of advice and information that I've ever put together. So like, please take it to heart. Try to use it. Oh, sorry, is anybody still taking pictures? Okay, good job. <laughs> All right, last section and we'll be out of here real soon. Headspace. This is all about your mental state. Very important, of course, because you are your best tool, as we've said. Uh, so saying yes to ideas. This is something uh, very important that a lot, a lot of people talk about. When you are coming up with ideas for new pieces or work or anything, like you're making a logo for a company, whatever, if you get together with other people in a room or even just by yourself, you are brainstorming, don't say no. Don't ever analyze in those situations. When you are brainstorming, that is a sacred yes space. That is adding on. You say yes and. You say like, okay, that's a wild idea. Keep rolling with it. Like there's a pirate ship. Okay, there's gonna be like frogs on that fire, pirate ship. <laughs> Thought of that because of the frog. Uh, but it's just like, you have to keep going in those moments. There's plenty of time to analyze later, but if people hear no, if your brain hears no more than like three times in a minute, it's shutting off. Like it's not gonna come up with any more ideas. It doesn't want to because you're just saying like, no, 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 that's not good. So please give yourself a fertile idea space, say yes. 
Comparison is one of the most horrible problems that we have right now. Thinking that other people are better than us because they do amazing art. Nope, that is not the case. I want you to rewire your brain to say, we are all making our own individual work. We are different. What I love about my piece, I don't necessarily love about your piece and vice versa. You are important and your own artist and I am not a part of that, but I appreciate what you're doing. That is what you have to think of. Uh, one of the tips that I wanna give with this also is if you ever feel yourself thinking those negative thoughts, like you will, every once in a while it happens. Uh, for some people it happens really often, but uh, what I want you to do in those moments is talk to the artist. If you swipe by something on Instagram you really like and you're like, dang it, I really wish I had that line quality or whatever, message them and say, I really love your line quality. You got something great out of that. This piece is my favorite you've done so far. Something like that. Like just reach out to them, say something. It doesn't matter if they respond. It is literally your reminder to stop that behavior and replace it with something productive. Comparison, don't do it. <laughs> Also, everybody's super valid. Like, like I said, everybody's art is valid. Don't ever think that you're not at a place that's like ready to show or whatever. Social media. You love it, you hate it. <laughs> uh, of course, this is everybody's bane, but I want to remind you that <laughs> you can curate this. Your phone doesn't have to tell you everything that's out there. Uh, block people. Feel like you can totally just like mute the heck out of conversations. I am reminded daily that other people hate Twitter. And I'm like, I love Twitter. And I'm thinking, I just follow the right people. They are not negative. They are like, it's a blossoming society on there. There are so many great children's book people and great talks going on. Uh, if you want a, a list of people to follow, just look at who I follow, honestly. Uh, but I want you to curate the heck out of your phone and just make sure that it becomes a place that you want to see. One of the best things that I realized lately is that I look forward to looking at my email inbox. <laughs> That's never happened before. It's because I've started sending emails that I want the response to. I only respond if there's like something that I can be excited about on the other end. If you're expecting a bad you know, note to come back, like try to change that conversation. Try to steer it in a, a way that will bring you something productive. Finding your spot. Literally, the sweet spot is what you're good at, what people like, and what you enjoy making. Uh, this is another reminder to find your niche. If you have trouble figuring out where you are in the art world, look at this and try to fit every piece of it to something together. Find that overlap. <laughs> I was just talking about this uh, at a talk uh, the other night or at dinner. I fail at this so often. When you... There was, okay, so our hotel neighbor was smoking and it like literally was getting into our room so much that when I woke up, my lungs were dead. And I was like, I have to give a talk. And I was telling this to my friend, Sid Weiler, and uh, she was like, you have to tell on them. Like seriously, get them kicked out of the hotel. And I'm like, you know, I would say that to my friend too, but I just, I like, I don't do that to myself. Like I don't give myself the the same love that I give to other people so often. And so I want to tell you guys, <laughs> don't, you know, don't do what I do, do what I say. Uh, treat yourself like a friend. If at any point you feel like you're putting yourself down, ask yourself, would I say that to my best friend? Would I ever look at an artist who's trying to get better and say that they're not doing enough or that their work is garbage? No, they're growing, they're learning. Why would you ever say that to them? So why would you say it to yourself? Take care of yourself, people. All right, and this is from SVS Learn. Uh, definitely take a picture of this. This is a website that Lee White, my mentor, works at, uh, and he's with Jake Parker, who invented Inktober, and Will Terry, who's a wonderful children's book illustrator. All of them are children's book illustrators. They have a podcast called Three Point Perspective that literally anybody who's in design wants to listen to. Uh, and they said that they have basically one piece per year that is great, per year that they really love, that they feel like is their move forward. So this is a reminder to not think that every piece is going to be your best, that every piece doesn't have to live up to the last one. There are going to be some that hit, some that miss, and find that one great one per year. Another thing that Jake Parker said is finished not perfect. He has a whole video describing what this means. Basically, uh, Lee also said in, uh, in school, because he was also my teacher before he was my mentor, uh, that 
finish not perfect, he said, do but not done. So it is the fact that we always feel like we can do more with a piece, that it's never really finished. But you have to say at some point, this is good, good enough. Like, okay, next piece, like move on. And everybody has their own limit to what that is, and every piece has its own limit to what is finished. Um, just remember that finished, not perfect. Uh, and this is not to put pressure on you, but you are the one that's in control. I mean this in the most positive way possible. You are the one who gets to decide what your life looks like. I know that being stuck in a job or not having the right life circumstances, uh, personal issues, like anything like that can come in the way, but you have to zoom out on your life. Just like we said, if it reads at a stamp size, it'll read as a mural. Same with your life. If you have zoomed out of your life and figured out your priorities, you will be much more able to take control of your own life and decide this is what I want, this is what I need. Then you make the steps to make it happen. Now it's time for you to do some work because, oh my gosh, we're going over time. Crap, crap, crap. Okay, revisit an old piece real quick. Uh, I did this a year ago. It was like really rewarding. So I want you guys to find a piece from like a year ago or more and just revisit it, redo it, make it pretty. Especially if it has something strong about it where it's like, oh, I really like that composition. But I want you to like really dive into the juicy bits. Uh, create a dream portfolio. This is something that Lee White told me about and I've absolutely loved it forever. Find your favorite artists and your favorite pieces from that artist uh, and figure out why that one. Pick it apart. Say like, do you love the values? Do you love the colors? Study their work. Make copies of it. Figure out how they actually made those brush strokes. I promise this will improve your work. These are artists that I put in my dream portfolio. They are absolutely amazing. Again, take pictures. Good job, guys. So many pictures to take home. Uh, and they're all amazing, so I want you guys to see that. If you like any of my work, you'll love their work. Thank you so much for being here. Seriously, thank you. Uh, I have one last thing. Oh, oh gosh. Uh, there are postcards at the Adobe Live booth. Uh, the survey helps everyone, so please take the survey after this. It helps you, it helps Max, it helps the speakers. It's great. Uh, and this is what it looks like. Yeah. Woo! We did it! Over time, but we did it. <laughs>